Jesus in Suburbia 3.0. Interestingly, in addition to his elected role, Councillor Treby is a Principal Policy and Strategy Officer with the State Government in Western Australia, and he's a great person to have on our Strategic Advisory Committee and within our governance structure, because he's a Fellow of the Governance Institute of Australia, a Fellow of the Chartered Governance Institute in London, he holds the designations of Chartered Secretary and Chartered Governance Professional. And I think he will govern this panel session very well. So, thanks, Brett. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back from that delicious lunch. I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to acknowledge the uh, First Nations people on whose land we meet today the Perignac people, and I pay res my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And just as my colleagues uh, Matt and Todd mentioned earlier this morning, I, would, I too would like to express my thanks and gratitude to Mayor David Leach and all from the Shire of Mount Barker for hosting us today in this very beautiful part of Australia. Over the past few years, Community resilience and the effects of climate change have been major drivers of regulatory and policy agendas across all levels of government in Australia. Resilience in Suburbia 3.0 and balancing residential growth in these complex policy and volatile climate environments takes new thinking and will require new thinking. In many growth areas, as you will no doubt be experiencing. The least and, sorry, the easiest and least constrained land has already been developed. Future growth will most likely occur in heavily constrained and challenging land typologies and future built form outcomes. We're very fortunate today. We have with us this afternoon three panel experts who will share their experiences and we will hear how they can or we can uh, create uh, resilient communities and suburbs. So for this session, let us consider a new suburb built at a rapid pace, filled with new residents in a new landscape that is inherently vulnerable, particularly as the frequency and intensity of natural disasters increases. But what could the community achieve if it were built with resilience in mind? What if it were designed to respond to the country on which it was built and the future communities who will call it home and place them in the forefront of our considerations? We will hear three different perspectives on resilience being the goal when, when designing and planning these new communities or economic activities or when designing policies to be suitable to the circumstances of people they apply to. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Um, if I could call forward uh, Samantha Rich and Gavin Cottrell. And we also have joining us virtually Dr. Sangeetha Chandra Shekharam. Welcome. <laughs> Adjunct lecturer uh, Samantha Rich uh, works with the UIA. Uh, Naira Lee Institute of Global Development. Did I say that correctly? Oh. <laughs> it's UI Naira Lee. Perfect. You've done well. Samantha is a Wurundjeri designer <coughs> and housing research dedicated to embedding First Nations worldview into the built environment. Her experience across diverse typologies of health, housing, urban design and designing for country has developed her skills in culturally sensitive design and engaging authentically with First Nations communities. Welcome, Samantha. Gavin Cottrell, our second speaker, is the founder and managing principal of GC3 Digital. Gavin is an acclaimed digital twin expert trusted by public and private executives to develop world-leading digital twin strategies and programs. With a career spanning three decades across the built and natural environments, he demonstrates a unique blend of policy, strategy, and business case 
experience. Welcome, Gavin. There's Sangeetha. Uh, Dr. San, uh, Sangeetha Chandra Shekharan is joining us virtually. Welcome. Sangeetha is an economic gra uh, geographer who focuses on the political economic dimensions of environmental change. She has researched the energy transition in Australia with a focus on social equity and environmental outcomes. Sangeetha is a senior research fellow on the Places Program in Life Course Centre, where she is leading research into the relationships between place, inequity, and the life course. Welcome, Sangeetha. Thanks very much. Excellent. Um, so without further ado, if I could call forward and introduce Samantha Rich. Samantha. Yiradu uh, Marang Niani, Baladu Varajri, you and do Samantha. That's just in my um, ancestors' language, Varajri language, just introducing myself, just saying hello to you all. Um, I'm a Varajri woman, um, Samantha. I've trained as an architect, but I also work um, across different fields, um, as you've heard, um, as a researcher for the community-led partnership called UI Narrowly, as well as teaching and um, more recently in the past couple of years working as a designing with country consultant. Um, so, um, my work involves working closely with First Nations communities to create outcomes that benefit them, uplift and preference their ways of being, doing and thinking, including perspectives, stories and history. Um, my work is embedded with designing with country, which means centering country, um, which is um, kind of defined as all human, more than human and non-human communities and moving away from human-centered design to kind of preference and um, equalize the environment or what we call environment, um, as well as um, our built spaces. So um, this underpins all of my, my work, but my main focus at the moment is in research and design. Um, and as stated, I'm working for UI Narrowly, which is a partnership between an Aboriginal community controlled organisation called Darawa Elders Group, which is located in a remote community called Walgett, and it's between UNSW as well. Um, so this partnership is really important because it was founded um, between the university when um, several kind of outcomes or initiatives were um, needed and the community kind of asked the university to come and provide expertise. And the difference between a lot of kind of, um, you know, partnerships or um, research kind of things is that this partnership is governed by the community. So at every kind of step of the process, the community is constantly telling us what they want or need us to look at and whether or not that will actually work in their community. And so, you know, you present all of the information and then they basically say, this is relevant, this is not relevant. So at every point of this partnership, they are always telling us exactly what is needed, which is really important. Um, you know, community has the answers and generally they might need extra expertise to kind of help them figure out how to kind of look at solving those. Um, so I've been involved with this partnership for just over two years and initially I was brought in to do a housing scoping exercise um, during the COVID-19 pandemic when the issue of housing shortages and overcrowding in a lot of um, Aboriginal communities became even more pertinent um, and they needed to have temporary housing so that families or individuals could safely isolate and prevent the spread of COVID. Um, during this scoping exercise, it was kind of understood that any temporary short-term housing would actually um, not be suitable for the community because it wouldn't be culturally appropriate, place-based kind of design, climatically wouldn't be appropriate for Walgett, which 
um, goes through, you know, about four or five months of summer and then very cold winters. Um, and so then the shift kind of changed in, in this relationship and looking at um, housing for young people, which was a research area that the team had, the team that I work with in this partnership had already been looking at. Um, and, um, and that was looking at the, the role of housing to reduce um, Aboriginal young people's contact with the criminal justice system. And so the team had already been building a um, youth diversionary kind of activities and what a lot of um, the researchers that are based in criminology or law had found is that, um, you know, by providing, you know, safe, affordable, healthy um, homes, this can kind of reduce the contact and, um, you know, you don't know Walgett, but Walgett is, um, you know, over police. There's about 41 police in a town of 1,800 people um, and it's a small town. So um, you can imagine that once um, police start to identify problem kids or young people, then that becomes a repeat thing and things as simple as housing um, is such an easy solution um, to kind of prevent kids that are, you know, either, um, you know, walking around, hanging out because they don't want to go home because it's overcrowded or maybe they've had a fight, you know, as many kind of young adolescent teenagers might do, have an argument with their parent and um, are out kind of hanging out with friends on the street. Anyway, so um, this is, you know, where the research is taken and then also simultaneously, um, looking at another housing need with this community partnership, which was ageing well on country. Um, and that basically looked at um, reciprocity. And so, you know, looking at these um, reciprocal re relationships of care that are embedded in, you know, Indigenous um, culture around caring for our elders, but also the really important thing of the knowledge transfer between elders and young people, and elders are entrusted with this um, responsibility to, in, in, you know, share their knowledge that they've, um, that's been imparted to them, to their community and to the young people, so that the next generation have those stories um, and have that knowledge. And so obviously when you take that away, um, you know, that knowledge is lost, and also the culture, you know, which is really important you know, kind of ties into the young people. If you don't have strong community cultural identity, um, you know, there tends to be, you know, some problems occurring. Um, and then only recently um, in November, unfortunately, the community were impacted by floods. And so um, the research is now kind of taken to looking at um, emergency or crisis accommodation to respond to future disasters but future crises that um, will, you know, uh, will impact them in the future and because of, unfortunately, um, a lot of Indigenous communities are in situations, both social, economical disadvantage, which kind of put, places them in a higher likelihood of um, being impacted by, um, you know, climate uh, disasters, but also kind of other disasters. Um, but also because generally of where they're kind of positioned, they are more at risk of being um, impacted by these things. And so starting to look at what is a um, community-led response to these types of situations which provide agency and voice to um, community-led um, organisations that are already doing really great work in this area and supporting them both in um, disaster preparedness but also in providing housing that can be, um, you know, supporting um, temporary kind of needs, but also um, if they do need to, um, unfortunately in Walgett, um, outside of, they have a levee bank to kind of keep water out and the two villages where, um, you know, during the process of colonization, they were forced out of certain areas and put into these villages. And so now these villages where a lot of the community live are actually outside of the levee bank. So they're more prone to flooding because they don't have a levee bank um, to stop water from flooding their homes. Um, so this is kind of what I've been doing in the research partnership. And then alongside that, I work in practice as an architect 
um, and doing a lot of work which marries really well with um, what I do in research, so looking at social and affordable housing in regional, remote and urban communities all across what we now call New South Wales and um, just kind of looking at how do we, um, you know, create um, healthy kind of climate or place-based housing for kind of poorer communities. Um, and then how do we also, I guess, you know, from this perspective of country, how do we kind of design in a way that centres country at the, um, you know, in our design, in both like our processes, but also in our projects. And obviously, um, you know, I, I've done a lot of work in um, looking at traditional Aboriginal architecture is that it's very place-based and it's responsive to climate and place. And, um, you know, I know going out to Wainamata, which is Western Sydney, you know, you go out there and there's houses that could be built anywhere in the world. And so um, the problem with kind of building in a way that doesn't kind of consider that place and what's there and the climate means that, um, you know, kind of there's an impact later down the line and there's an impact on country because everything you put on country is um, then a part of it. And so then trying to, in my practice, um, trying to kind of teach this re relationality and holistic kind of way of looking at um, design in spaces and buildings. Um, and uh, being a Rajri woman, um, I'm really kind of propelled and um, driven by uh, Rajri ways of being, knowing, thinking and doing. Um, so two main ones in my work is um, Yindamara, which means um, means several things and it's kind of more of a philosophy rather than, um, you know, kind of a single idea, but it's a way of going slowly, thoughtfully, respectfully and with honour. And um, obviously this is really kind of important in projects because especially with communities, we have a tendency, um, especially in the architecture business, to kind of really be trying to get things delivered and have these tight time frames which don't always support kind of listening and, and taking things, um, you know, thinking about things thoroughly so we don't keep making the same mistakes that we've made in the past. Um, and then further to that is um, Wallamara, which is also means several things, which um, it's to kind of act as a custodian or a protector. And most of my work that I do as a designer is not on my own country. So I need to always be acting in a way um, that is a custodian of that place, but also of that knowledge and treating kind of whatever knowledge um, that, you know, is shared with me through that project or any wishes by that local community with honour and making sure that it's protected and that I fight for what they want in that place. Um, but secondly, that word means to do the right way. And that can be enacting cultural protocols in my community so that, you know, I have a duty of care as a Rajri woman, both to my own community, but to any Aboriginal community that I work with to act in an appropriate way um, so, you know, doing everything that all of the other kind of ideas have suggested in, you know, um, being respectful of the elders, not forcing things in a certain direction, honouring what they've told me and things like that. So, yeah, so that's kind of what I do in, um, in my work. <laughs> Mandangul. <laughs> Thanks very much, Samantha. I, I think it's probably also a good idea if we probably should have left you there and just you could have presented from there rather than yeah. just chopping and changing around. It's after lunch exercise. Um, Gavin, if I could uh, ask you and possibly if you can, oh, there, if you do have a microphone there. There should be a uh, presentation. It's up there? No, the presentation. Yep. Okay, well, while that's loading up, thank you very much for the opportunity today to, uh, to come and talk today. Bronwyn, thank you very much for the opportunity. Bronwyn and I first met, um, I actually run a, apart from my day job, a leadership of a digital twin partnership group. That is a new industry group to try to build capacity and capability for the digital twin market. 
in terms of to help provide government with a more of a consistent voice and a consistent message to help you meet your policy and objectives. So Bronwyn was a bit out of her comfort zone with the Digital Twin Partnership. Now it's my turn to be a bit out of my uh, comfort zone um, today. It's a bit scary when you hear about three decades and you realise in terms of uh, uh, how time goes quickly. So I've been fortunate enough, I've worked with the UK government, uh, Commonwealth government here, I'm currently working with the Queensland government, helping them plan for the Olympics at the moment. Uh, also working with Victoria, with the Digital Twin Victoria program, and also working with the City of Melbourne at the moment about how they can better deliver their services. However, my probably my most exciting project I'm currently working on at the moment is the Marlborough region. Has anyone not heard of the Marlborough region in New Zealand or someone who hasn't had a glass of Sauvignon Blanc? Okay, so 52,000 people, their main uh, industries are manufacturing, i.e. viticulture, uh, winemaking, for, for no surprise, uh, aquaculture, viniculture, tourism. Has anyone been here to, to Marlborough? Yes, stun stunning place. Marlborough sounds uh, absolutely uh, stunning. They've got very different drivers and issues compared to, say, I'm working with City of Melbourne or in terms of Victoria or the Olympic Games. They've got their own unique issues, and we're going to talk about resilience um, today. So um, we've been currently developing a business case and strategy for them, and they're looking to implement some tech uh, in terms of to help meet their policy and objectives. And really, that's my role, is to break down the tech the data, the digital component, and make it real from a policy and strategic objectives. I've failed if I haven't brought their strategic objective to life. Okay, and that's really important. So the three problem statements that we've identified working with Marlborough at the moment is leveraging data and information as an asset. I'm 50 years old this year and I still can't believe we're in a built and natural environment and we still treat information and data so poorly. We treat it like garbage. We don't. We treat our physical assets better, but we need to be focusing on around how we focus data as an asset and to get value out of that. Because you pay for it time and time and time. The various different consultants that you will pay to do whatever, that will get redone, redone, redone. So we've got to get better in terms of how do we leverage data uh, as an asset, and that's something in terms of we're looking to do with them. They've got a three waters program, their water reform program. They want to understand in terms of how data can support them with that program. But really, it's the bottom problem statement. How do we manage resilience and recovery? They suffer from earthquakes and flooding. And we're going to talk today about in terms of how data and information and tech can support that. Who here has heard of a digital twin? It's someone you saw with a scarf. How, how would you describe what a digital twin is? pretty good. <laughs> Digital twin can mean many different different things. If I ask other people in the room, you'll get a different answer. You've got to work out in terms of what is the problem we're trying to solve. So for, from a Marlborough perspective, they, they want to be able to visualize and integrate disparate data that they can perform some analysis and simulation capability to that to bring their strategic objectives to life. I don't normally, in terms of, want to ask in terms of from a technical question, but it's it's good, good to gauge in terms of how many people have heard around what digital twin is or isn't. So the three problem statements we got: we got leveraging data and information as an asset, managing local government refor reforms, and managing resilience and recovery. So how can we bring technology and data to support the delivery of that? So in the city of Melbourne, as a good example, they put the bike lanes in the wrong location. They didn't have enough information to understand what the unintended consequences are of putting those uh, bike lanes there from an economic development, from a health and safety perspective. What does that mean? They've spent money in having to create capital costs in terms of creating those bike lanes and now they're gonna have to reroute them. 
So wouldn't it be great to actually digitally rehearse that first to understand what are the unintended consequences are? Simulation's been around forever, but what we need to do with a digital twin is how do you bring disparate informations together and understand what the disparate what the, what the unintended consequences are. How do we better understand the, the performance of our assets? I was speaking to Jessica in terms about potholes here for a massive issue. Wouldn't it be great if we put a camera in front of our buses and our garbage collection to actually pick up those data sets, feed that back in, understand what weather patterns could actually impact for or why are we getting more? How do we get data to support our decision making better? And that's part of what in terms of Marlborough is doing. So I've highlighted in green, there's Strategic planning, consents, compliance, external stakeholders, economic development, assets and services, property. But we're just in today, we're talking about environmental science and monitoring and in terms of improving policy. So we've developed 81 separate use cases. So what on this matrix you see here is their services in the horizontal. I haven't got my glasses to read all of them, but there will be environmental assets, uh, consents, compliance, economic support, etc and their strategic objectives are their smart and connected strategic objectives. So what you see here is in terms of how you can enable, how digital twin use cases can enable policy and to help deliver better services. We shortlisted them in terms of to another further 21 and for today's purposes you can see in terms of from a resilience perspective, flood management, climate analysis, uh, resilience planning, etc., in terms of the, the various different use cases uh, that are available. But when we talk about use cases, we mean an application. So what is the problem we're trying to solve? So how do we uh, understand the impact of future flooding? Marlborough suffers hugely from, from this and impacts from them from their, the, from their manufacturing, viticulture, etc., economic development. So how do we assess understanding what that impact is, whether we want to build new subdivisions, uh, new wineries, whatever they're in terms of their, their strategic objectives. So what's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the target outcome? What the benefits are? Each one of them are being economically assessed in terms of understanding what that return on investment. And then we'll be, we're currently assessing technology partners at the moment to implement these use cases later this year. They're not alone. We do, we've been previously worked with, uh, with Greater Hobart Region from a, a sort of rural uh, a regional and, and, and urban perspective, about to start work with the Canterbury region, with WiMAC, Selwyn and Christchurch working together in terms of understanding about how digital and data can help support them. So digital and tech and data is not just about big ugly infrastructure projects and big state government projects, it can help you as a regional council, you've just got to work out what are the problems that you're trying to solve. And I always say to all clients, think big, start small, move quickly because we're going to really struggle to deliver the services for tomorrow we saw, to, we saw the future growth we're struggling to deliver services that we are now so how are we going to deliver services for the future by using old analog methods we've got to think about new ways of delivering services and to be honest it's down to as i was speaking to jessica earlier it's down to the leadership of people within these councils within these cities within the governments who are driving this agenda so our role as industry is to help inform you in terms of there are better ways of doing things. It takes leadership to actually take to do things differently at the moment. So what I'll leave you with in terms of for anyone doing any tech digital program, understand what the problem you're trying to solve, why are you doing it? If you can't answer that question, I wouldn't, I wouldn't proceed with your program. Otherwise you'll just have a solution looking for a problem. Understand what capabilities you have and what you need. You've got a lot of councils, a lot of cities, a lot of governments have a lot of brilliant technical people. You don't need to bring in a whole consultant team to come in to help. You, you can start today. Just start understanding about what you have and what you don't have. And lastly, have an executive buy-in. Very difficult to do any uh, digital agenda without an executive uh, buy-in. I won't tell you which uh, client at the moment, but the executives aren't bought in, but the councillors are. So when we're proceeding, for obvious reasons there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gavin. Um, very enlightening, uh, tremendous. 
If we can also, if I could take this opportunity to introduce our third speaker, um, Sangeetha, um, if you could take the opportunity to, to address us today, that'd be great. Thanks very much. How's the sound? Can you hear me? <laughs> Loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I have a child with COVID at home, so um, I, it's just been a, a busy time here. Um, I wanted to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Paramount people of um, uh, on, the, on the land and waters on which you are right now, and the Wurundjeri people on whose land I sit today, um, the custodians of um, unceded land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders. Um, I'm a research fellow at an um, Australian Research Council funded centre of excellence that looks at disadvantage in the life course. Um, the research I'm going to present today could not have occurred without um, my colleagues. So I just want to um, say thanks to Julia de Bruyn, um, Damien Sullivan, and David Bryant, the last two from the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence, and also Dean Lombard, who's collaborated on the second, um, the second um, project I'll be talking about. Okay, so today I want to ask a couple of questions around um, resilience um, that don't get asked enough, I think. Resilience for whom and resilience at what scale? And to do that, I'm going to talk, just whiz through two research projects that um, I've been leading, um, one on electrification of low-income households, and the other is the development of a microgrid into regional towns in northwest Victoria. Um, so as part of its commitment, just to move this, um, as part of its commitment to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, the Victorian state government is planning a transition away from natural, natural gas. And the gas substitution roadmap that they've put, provided has highlighted the important role electrification um, plays. Um, by that, I mean replacing gas appliances with electric ones in homes for heating, cooking, hot water, etc. Victoria has the highest level of residential gas use in Australia, and it's highest in the metro areas, but other states and territories are facing very similar challenges. Gas makes up a significant proportion of household energy consumption and contributes around 17% to greenhouse gas emissions. Now, electrification obviously presents upfront costs of new appliances and technologies, but as the graph shows, for those who are willing and able to make these changes, there are a lot of benefits, both in terms of reliability and affordability. Gas prices have um, increased more rapidly than um, electricity prices in the last 18 months. So there are even greater savings from switching to electricity than this gra graph shows. And it's even better if you have solar power. So um, in turn, these higher prices can accelerate um, households who can to depart from the gas network, which increases prices further for those who are stuck on the network. So electrification really provides um, resilience for households if it's well planned, but who can actually capture these benefits and who might lose out? And that's really what's inspired the research that we've done. So I'll skip through this slide, which is the rapid transition scenario away from gas that the Victorian government has put forward and some of the programs that, that exist to incentivize it. So we, we see a blind spot to date on um, analysis research on the, on the differentiated impacts of the gas transition. And we wanted to ask who is particularly vulnerable and how are they vulnerable in the gas transition? So this research was a partnership between my Centre of Excellence and the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence, which had all kinds of um, co-benefits. We really relied on the institutional trust that the Brotherhood has to be able to conduct um, a survey and focus group discussions. We recruited households who had received energy-related support from the Brotherhood and who had a lower income. And we also um, increased the representation of culturally and linguistically diverse participants through some targeted um, surveys and focus group interviews with the Burmese community in Melbourne. Um, in terms of our sample, there was a reasonable mix of tenure um, and household composition. We had high levels of income support de dependence or need, 
And overall, the sample skewed a bit to older respondents, which explains why we had a reasonably high, as you can see, 31 per cent um, of the sample who owned their home outright. Um, through our analysis, we, um, we found that there was higher financial stress than in other, um, other longitudinal data sets, such as HILDA. And, high, and this higher financial stress was linked to people of a younger age, lower income, private rental or social housing, single parent households and people with a disability. Now, higher energy hardship itself, which is the inability to meet your energy needs um, for basic well-being, and also perhaps foregoing um, at, or rationing energy to be able to um, to, to be able to um, maintain financial security. Um, higher energy hardship was linked to um, younger age renters. So the survey respondents were mainly using gas, and they were much more conscious of limiting their energy use than the infrastructure Victoria sample that was done um, 12 months before this. And you can see that we had, in terms of those who had um, had an indicator of energy hardship, inability to pay bills, heat home, or go on without meals, that was almost two thirds of our sample. Interestingly, despite all of this, overall there was a very high level of support for the transition away from gas. So over two thirds were supportive and half strongly supported. Um, this is despite the fact also that there was a strong preference for gas over electricity, particularly for stovetop cooking. And the, there was a positive perception, um, sorry, the positive perception for gas was less marked in our group than in the general population, if we compare it with the Infrastructure Victoria sample. What kind of programs um, and policies can make a difference? Well, we, in, in our research, we found that the Soul Homes program, program had high awareness by homeowners twice as much as non-homeowners and higher uptake as well compared to renters. But information about how, how to highly, uh, sorry, information about how to electrify was more highly sought after by people who spoke another language other than English at home. And there was support for grant, the support for grants to improve energy efficiency and lower energy tariffs were favored by those who were very conscious of limiting their energy use. So in our sample, these can be described as people either experiencing energy hardship or some were vulnerable to energy hardship in the short to medium term. And there were others who weren't actually experiencing um, energy hardship, but they lacked the capacity to transition. And I can talk more about that if there are some questions. So for the first two groups, the inner circles, the barriers to electrification are just part of a set of financial and other challenges that they face. In terms of key findings, we will be releasing this report towards the end of the month. Um, uh, obviously, home ownership was a defining driver for electrification and renters are really being left behind. Also, being able to have financial capacity, savings and credit was a major um, enabler of electrification. And we found very complex customer journeys through the process of um, shifting to electricity and away from gas. Um, and this requires much more attention to consumers' journeys um, as opposed to outcomes. In terms of resilience, um, the most vulnerable households um, need to be at the center of planning for the energy transition. And knowing who is vulnerable and how in different spatial areas is really key and a lot more work is needed in this area. I'm gonna very quickly now talk to you about another project that I'm working on, um, which is a feasibility study for microgrids in um, Northwest Victoria. It's the two stars on the screen. So um, quite far out in the upper Northwest, um, largely out agricultural land. So whilst the geography and demography is very different to, to some of these urban growth areas, the, the increase in solar and batteries in this, this area and the desire for great, greater community control does have an analog with growth areas, urban growth areas, which ha often have larger solar installations and are also facing network constraints. The question of whether there are more local and decentralized alternatives to costly network solutions is very relevant. So there's no official definition of a microgrid in the current regulation. The key characteristics that we have defined through consultation are a distinct interconnected local energy system that can operate as a single entity that's connected to the grid. And through this connection, there can be a balancing and optimization of generation and storage with the grid. 
Importantly, the microgrid is really designed to benefit the community, but it also has to balance the interests of other grid users more generally, and importantly, principles of equity. Central to the microgrid is what the community aspires to achieve, and our, in our research, the following community values were, were really highly ranked. Emissions reduction, improving reliability and resilience. So this is an area where there's um, high bushfire risk and also recent flooding. Being able to manage energy costs, local ownership and greater control of energy resources, and supporting local economic development. And the communities said they really wanted more reliability and resilience, especially for um, essential services and, and to be able to um, service vulnerable groups in the community. So the community's ability to achieve enhanced resilience through microgrids is constrained by existing regulatory settings. The network regulatory framework doesn't fully account for the value of investments to increase resilience to natural hazard events or improved reliability after a long localised outage. The costs of restoring supply after a major event can be passed through, but investment in resilience in advance to reduce those inevitable costs is not valued. So it, the, the network regulation does in, the incentivize investment to meet reliability standards, but not this kind of proactive um, uh, uh, resilience that people are trying to create through microgrids. So we need to better understand in this, re, um, in terms of microgrids, the value of local benefits from local coordination of energy resources. And we can't wait to do this. The energy transition is fully on from, decentral, from centralized to decentralized energy, from fossil fuels to renewables. There are a lot of opportunities to enhance resilience and reduce emissions at the local scale. We observe that there's very differentiated local government capacity to lead and facilitate um, and you see some, uh, lots of leadership in, in some urban areas, but it, there's a lack of resourcing and capacity building overall to bring local governments to the same level where they can work with their communities to develop these more resilient energy solutions. I might just leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sang. Nathan. that's fantastic. Um, We've heard from uh, three different perspectives on the, uh, on the issue of building resilience in suburbia 3.0. Uh, certainly hearing first from Samantha, uh, talking about the First Nations people and their original dislocation, recognising, and, and from what I heard from uh, Samantha's um, talk, they recognise the challenges of their environment, but they, uh, those people were dislocated from those areas where they had managed to meet those, uh, those challenges into other areas that needed to, uh, uh, to, to deal with that uh, over again. But, and also working with First Nations communities other than our own and respecting their traditions in trying to work with them to, to assist in their, their development. Um, Gavin uh, clearly has a very strong message on digital data capture. And um, very strong message, I think, throughout the community these days is recognising data as an asset, a critical asset for um, for our communities. And I think that's uh, that's a very salient, uh, very salient word. But the benefits and values of scenario scenario analysing future tech and uh, development options, I think, using data um, is uh, is. It's certainly invaluable, and I think that message came through quite well. And Sangeetha, speaking about uh, electrification, resilience, and the challenges associated to energy transition, um, I think was also a very strong message that, that we've got. Um, and uh, the research demonstrating that uh, high energy hardship is really uh, hitting the younger demographics within it, within our community uh, quite hard, and that would be affecting their capacity to transition uh, from gas through to electricity. And the values and benefits of microgrids and discrete communities, uh, so as those communities can manage their, uh, their power needs more discreetly, build resilience, uh, and certainly within regard to an area of higher risk, of natural disasters. Uh, that was a very strong message as well. We've come to that stage where um, we can accept some, uh, some questions from the audience. So if anyone has any burning questions, please feel free. There are uh, one or two microphones around. 
So if you have any questions, that would be fantastic. <coughs> Stephen. Thanks, Brett, and I'm very pleased to hear this topic, particularly around energy resilience. It is one of the defining things that will change suburbia 3.0, I, I think, the next, uh, next 10, 20 years. Gavin, I'm keen to understand from your modelling, have you considered the issue of stored energy in any of your uh, suburban projects? I say that in the back of federal government projects now which are looking to provide regional scale or suburban based batteries. We have a number in communities in Perth, there's one going into the city of Swan at the moment, I know there's one in the city of Guanana. But have you looked at that as a, as a tool and what does it tell you about improving the resilience when th that goes in? I note that one of the more interesting challenges for us has been that communities designed a bit like NBN. NBN was retrofitted. Where do you find the box to put NBN? When you're going to find a location to install a, a big power battery in a regional uh, suburb, you've got to find a location for that. So have you done any modelling uh, around it and what is it telling us about the future of energy use and storage for the future? Yeah, there's a quick answer to that in terms of the, the actually the energy sector in terms of from a, a digital twin perspective and scenario planning isn't that joined up there in terms of compared to some of the other uh, sectors whether it's infrastructure water utilities city planning um, it's been very much discretional in terms of in-house essential energy is probably in new south wales is probably the most advanced um, but we're not seeing again we're not there's a, there's a chap called Patrick Bossart who came from the UK who, who, who led the digital railway work and he's been leading the work in, for, from essential energy to, to look at that understanding of stored energy in, in terms of from that. So the, the message is, is in terms of we're not getting enough leadership within organisations to understand about how digital and data can help drive better outcomes, whether that's through scenario planning in terms of whether it's from better analysis understanding the performance of, of, of current assets. So again, it goes down to, from a people perspective, we talk a lot about digital data, it, technology, etc. but we need leaders within organisations to, to take this on board, to realise there are better ways of, of, of doing things. And that goes for any organisation, doesn't have to be just from an energy perspective, it could be from a, a regional council, uh, a metropolitan council, state government. Um, we need we need to demonstrate in terms of better leadership within these positions to, to, to do things better. Thanks, Gavin. Are there any further questions? I have a couple myself. Um, Samantha, um, the last census showed us that there were more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living in outer suburban areas in our council areas across Australia and certainly in every capital city, with the exception of Brisbane. What is a policy or practice shift uh, local government could make or advocate for that would lead to resilient First Nations communities? Um, it's a big question. Uh, I, I guess I think it's about, um, you know, kind of having policy that supports um, I guess, you know, the conversation around the voice is kind of talking to communities a bit more about what they actually want and need. Um, and I would actually say that, unfortunately, um, that census wasn't always correct. I know, um, just to advocate for the community that I work for, um, you know, they're not already always going out and um, getting community people to collect that information, which means that, it's not always collected in the right way. And because of the history of this country, there's a distrust for government around um, providing information and you know data sovereignty issues around how that data is collected and then how it's shared with community. Um, so just kind of as a preference, um, I would say that there's probably more than what is even evident within the census because of the way that it's conducted. Um, so I think first and foremost is like putting in policy in place which um, 
you know, has data sovereignty for communities so that, you know, in terms of funding for things that communities need, it's actually reflective of what that community looks like. Um, and then kind of, um, you know, pushing back against things that we have around just kind of delivering the same thing for every person. Um, you know, I speak from one perspective of a community um, where there's quite a diverse and multitude and complex um, opinions, cultures um, and ways of acting. So I think just kind of, yeah, um, supporting that kind of diversity is really important in, you know, all of your regions that you're kind of working in. Um, it's not kind of a one size fits all. And I think that we make that mistake in too many aspects of how we operate in any kind of business. I actually like that answer. I think the, the practice shift message there to the federal government is it isn't a one size fits all model if you're getting that census data. It should be sympathetic to all of the community and, and community types out there. I think that was a, that was a very good, good message coming out of that. Thank you. Um, Gavin, when is the right time for local government to, to incorporate digital twins in their aim for resilient suburbs, economies and, and, and communities? How can local government overcome some of the big barriers to working with digital twins, such as capacity and cost, especially smaller councils who were just beginning their, their growth journey? Yeah, it's a good question. We have this, we have this question a lot about in terms of how does this apply to me? When do I start? Typically, in terms of tech programs, just are seen as another IT project, and it becomes another line on the balance sheet that are going through constraints at the moment, and it just becomes things. So, typically, what you need to do, so for, for example, with City of Melbourne, we've advocated that you um, add the, the digital twin program to Green Line. So it becomes more of a political, so in terms of that you need to demonstrate that value proposition. So you get out things out of PowerPoint into, in, in, into reality. So what is your pain point? So if, for example, another one with Melbourne is shop front vacancy uh, reduction, which is reducing their rates. So we've developed a use case in terms of how we could test certain policies, because Melbourne's moving from a... Uh, a dual daytime night kind economy and it's moving into more of a nighttime economy so how can you repurpose some of those empty shops now into into something else and testing those scenarios rates uh, in terms of that's from a rates perspective or from a, a graffiti perspective and cleaning perspective it needs to tie into the problems that you're facing at the moment um, even with the Olympics at the moment what we're doing with 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 we're thinking about just implementing three use cases to start. So mm -hmm. just doing some testing now, focusing on from a planning perspective. So it needs to tie into whatever strategic objectives that your your pain points, whether it's economic development, um, but typically councils focus on better service delivery. They're less focused on CapEx and OpEx, but around better service delivery. But if I was working with a client, working with Sydney Metro, a big, massive, they'd be focusing more on CapEx and OpEx. So for, for local government, it's around how do I better deliver services to the public? That would be my advice in terms of uh, to start. Excellent. Thanks, Gavin. Um, at Sangeetha, can I um, pose you a question? When so much of what causes inequity and poverty is shared responsibility, as in there's no one single fix, no one magic bullet, do you think there is an increasing role for local government in equipping their communities to be resilient? Um, absolutely. I think just from the conversation we've been having, whether you're talking about new energy technologies like batteries and solar or electric vehicles, or you're talking about the needs of First Nations, the diverse needs of First Nations in different urban and non-urban settings, it's really important to understand the diversity of needs and the complex households and communities that are out there. And local government understands that better than the different tiers of government. 
The problem is, of course, that there are jurisdictional issues, there are capacity issues, and there are resourcing issues. And local government, many local governments are overwhelmed by the existing pressures, whether it be around service delivery or investment, et cetera, that they face. And then you bring in new challenges, like, for example, local community energy aspirations, or that being the first example. So then the pressure is on, I think, local government to be able to understand how they can play a role to enable community aspirations. And I can see in the project that we've done how that really shines a spotlight on local governments. Because essentially the private models for trying to deliver community energy or the private retail models, for example, or the distributor-led models have all kinds of issues associated with them. And what you really need is a not-for-profit community organization and or a local government-enabled community organization that can deliver these public benefits to the community based on their needs. So I think there is a growing need for local government to be involved in the energy transition. But I think there's a big conversation to be had about how to build capacity for local government to be able to do that, recognizing that there is lots of leadership out there, but it's uneven. Excellent. Thank you for that response, Agnetha. Are there any further questions from the audience at all today? Oh, down the back. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Sangeetha. I'm Karen Sherry from Hume City Council. And this is more of a comment, and because the Victorian government have, in conjunction with the federal government, have got some good rebates going for things like replacement of gas hot water with electric heat pump hot water systems. But I think that people aren't aware of them. Uh, and, you know, you can... Generally, it, it will cost for a family-sized system, say 265 litres. Most retailers that are selling these units will probably... You, you'll, you could probably end up being out of pocket $950. But I think that that is quite a large sum for a low-income family or for pensioners or, you know, home owners of rental properties might balk at that. So what are your suggestions, if I can put that on you? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a really good question. So our research showed that there was um, the power saving bonus, which is a $250 cash payment that was given to households to try and um, account for some of the increase in electricity price rises. It was a high level of awareness of that. But when it came to some of these appliance replacement programs, like the Victorian Energy Upgrades Project Program or the Home Heating and Cooling Upgrades Program that's means tested and targeted at lower income households, um, only a third of our sample um, were aware of it and even um, less had actually taken up those opportunities. And I think you're getting at some of the reasons why. So first of all, homeowners are much more likely to be able to recoup the benefits of this because they're in one place for a sustained time and they're upgrading um, with potential um, resale benefits down the track, but also just everyday benefits. But renters are really the group that are most left behind. So these programs are available to renters, but the, up the awareness and uptake was even lower. Um, uh, uh, rental providers or landlords um, are generally a bit slow to take these up. And we had, um, we had people in our focus groups who weren't aware of these programs when they came up. Um, and then when they were, they told their rental provider um, and they still had reluctance to be able to, to um, take up the program and install the new appliance. So this is the, the, the ongoing issue around renters and the split incentive problems. Um, there's uh, real issues around, um, around people's capacity to um, invest. And so we think there, need to be, uh, there needs to be a real ramping up of um, no interest or low interest loans for um, rental households 
to be able to encourage their rental provider to be able to invest um, at, whilst they recoup the benefits. There are also a couple of other different models um, that allow the um, the the, that allow the cost of these programs to be taken off the um, council charges, for example, um, and I think they could be explored more. But really what we need is a large scale um, retrofit program for lower income rental um, properties um, across the country, really. Social housing has a series of problems as well, but at least that has been recognised and there is an attempt to upgrade um, social housing as part of the um, Victorian big build, for example. But it's really renters in low income housing who are left behind and there needs to be a lot more policy innovation and resourcing and capacity building um, focused on that problem. Excellent. Thanks again, Sag, Nitha. Um, I think we, uh, we probably need to draw the session to a close. I'm uh, probably about five minutes over and I think Bronwyn's staring daggers at me. <laughs>